Claude, settling into a life of unexpected freedom, was about to continue his work for the Leone family at Joey Leone's auto repair shop when he heard a sound. A relentless ringing of the public telephone. Claude doesn't speak much, but that doesn't mean he can't listen to the needs of the citizens in Portland. And Marty Chonks is a citizen in need. The name's Chonks, Marty Chonks. I got money troubles, but hey, who doesn't, right? I'm the Patient Wolf, and I'm a video game storyteller. This video charts the tales of the lesser known characters in Liberty City. They are cautious individuals only commissioning Claude to save their business interest via public payphone. Claude gets a page. These gang leaders and ne'er-do-wells give Claude the brief. All these men, are men under pressure and are doing what they can to survive in this corrupt city. This is a compilation of four stories within the 3D Grand Theft Auto universe. So make sure to subscribe for future GTA stories, like the video if you did, and settle in as we discover the complete story of the phone missions in Grand Theft Auto 3. Claude's reputation is spreading fast. He gets any job done, no questions asked, for the right price. Marty could see the work he was doing for the Leone family. After all, his pet food factory, Bitchin' Dog Food Company, lies only yards away from Joey Leone's garage. And Marty needs a man like Claude for a particular set of problems. Marty had dug himself a hole, all in the name of saving his failing company. He has borrowed more and more to keep his empire alive, but the tide is getting too strong. It's not entirely bad management. Liberty City voted to clamp down on dog ownership in the city in a bid to clear up the mess from the sidewalks. The restriction has been in place for five years, and this is where Marty's problem started. Trying to keep the company afloat while he lobbied for a repeal on the law. In the meantime, to keep his business, he needs to resort to drastic measures. Measures Claude can help carry out to the letter. I'm meeting my bank manager later. He's a crooked bastard that keeps bumping up the loan repayment so he can cut a slice. Take my car, pick him up, and bring him back here. I got a little surprise for that blood-sucking leech. Marty's factory did not look like a bustling machine of industry. He's had to lay off staff and production has ground to a halt. Claude can see these are desperate times for Marty. But if he still has money to pay Claude, he'll happily be his guy. He picks up the bank manager looking to squeeze the final drops of blood from the stone. Ah, oh, Mr. Chunk sent you, did he? Let's go and pay the fellow a visit. Claude's job is simple. A taxi service. He can do that no problem makes a relaxing change from some of the work he had been carrying out for the Leones of late. On dropping off the bank manager, Claude could not resist sticking around to see just what this surprise could be. Get your hands off me ass, Pete! The final words of the bank manager, Marty choosing the last resort to end his problems. Claude is used to that. He disposes of the car so no tracks leading back to himself or Marty. The acts of a desperate man still in the hole, Claude knows this won't be the last job he'll do for him. I hired some thieves to break into my apartment and steal some stuff so I could claim on the insurance as you do. The thieving bastards are threatening to tell the insurance company if I don't give them a cut. Another chauffeur job, but not as straightforward this time. Chinatown is not such a safe place for a guy connected with the Leones. The triads don't forget a face. The thieves agree to meet at the factory under the guise that Marty has agreed to their demands. But Marty refuses to be blackmailed. If he can stand up for himself against the big corporate money machines, two chancing crooks won't face him. As they enter the factory, Claude knows what's coming. Easy there, partner. Whoa! Put it down. Not? Come on, put it down. Claude can't see the method, but he can hear that they have met their end. After taking the car to be detailed and sprayed, he returns to another task for Marty Chonks. 
Marty's relentless focus on his failing business has led to a failing marriage. They don't even talk anymore, and Marty's sure she's now in the arms of another. If his own wife can't stick by him and help him through this, then he'll find a way that she can. My wife has an insurance policy, and all she's ever been to me is a hole in my pocket. Go and pick up my wife from Classic Nails and bring her back to the factory. Claude would usually bulk the moment anyone suggested taxiing their wife to certain death, but Claude had had his own share of relationship troubles in Catalina. To Claude, betrayal is a crime that deserves punishment. Claude knows classic nails, just down the street from ammunition. He's starting to know Portland like the back of his hand. Marty wants to see me? Well, it better be quick because I have to get my hair done. Marty's wife will never make that appointment. Well practiced now in killing, Marty has no problem in doing the same to his wife. Hattie, <laughs> stop! Claude disposes of the car at Portland Docks. Marty would report her disappearance and eventually claim on the policy. Would that be enough to save his dog food empire? When you try to bury your problems, you just dig up more. Damn, I'm in trouble. Turns out my wife was seeing some guy I owe money to. A loan shark taking a portion of the interest on the principal through time with Marty's wife. Insult to injury. Claude was to pick the lover up. Marty knew just how to deal with him. But before Claude leaves, he finds out something he'd been wondering for a while. Claude brings the victims. Marty kills them. But what does Marty do with the bodies? What would you do if you owned a pet food factory? He's got real angry and he's looking for payback. I've agreed to see him. He thinks I'm gonna pay him off. But my guess is Liberty's dogs are gonna get yet another flavor this month. Not only does killing these people solve certain problems, those people also help with Marty's ingredients costs. Claude brings them in and they leave in cans to the expectant dogs of Liberty. Simple but ingenious. Having committed three murders in quick succession, Marty is effectively a serial killer. But there are no shortage of those in Liberty. Claude picks up the loan shark. Party tincture, huh? Okay, I'm gonna show that creep the meaning of the word business. Claude had a feeling that this might be the last job he did for Marty. This guy wasn't a buttoned up banker, a two bit thief, or an adulterous wife. This was a street boss. Claude could have stepped in, but he's about had enough of driving for Marty. And Marty, for the first time in the flesh, is out front to meet them. Carl, uh, hi. Uh, I, uh, I need more time to get your money. But if you just step into my office, it's far too late for that, Marty. You had your chance, but now I'm taking over the business. Marty thought that to save his business, he had to play down in the gutter, like most of the people in this city. But in swimming with the sharks, it was only a matter of time before he was swallowed up. Marty's troubles are over. The bitchin' dog food factory has a new owner, and that owner would quickly hand over ownership to a well-known citizen of Liberty. Donald Love's company, Love Media, would take control of the factory. Maybe Donald heard about the type of food they occasionally served. Cuisine he was partial to himself. To hear more about Love, watch this video linked above now. Claude came out of this okay, more dollars for his pocket, and he would help many more members of the criminal underworld before his time in Liberty was through. I got me a whole string. It was shortly after being freed on Callahan Bridge that Claude first came into contact with El Burrow. This is El Burro of the Diablos. You are new in Liberty, but already you are gaining a reputation on the streets. Claude had so far earned that reputation. From the moment 8-Ball introduced Claude to the Leones, Claude has not stopped. He's not stopped swinging, shooting, detonating, all the while speeding through the streets of Portland, 
in any car he can get his hands on. Because movement in the city is restricted, due to the collapse of the bridge, the people of Portland are confined to Portland. El Burro and his gang resides in Hepburn Heights, and to keep the spirits of his men, the Diablos, elevated, he has arranged a street race. Having seen Claude careering through the neighborhood many times over the last few weeks, El Burro is keen to see how he will fare. He invites him to the starting line. There is a street race starting by the old school hall near the Callahan Bridge. Get yourself some wheels, and first through all the checkpoints wins the prize. Claude doesn't need to be asked twice. The only question is, what car should he drive? El Burro is the leader of one of the many gangs here in Liberty City, the Diablos. In recent years, they've made Hepburn Heights their home. They are proud of their neighborhood and wear their colors on the streets at any opportunity. One signifier of their affiliation is the cars they drive, often opting for a tricked out stallion with fiery stripes and exposed engine. Claude has stolen his fair share of stallions from the Diablos. He admired their acceleration and top speed, even if the steering was a little loose at times. Claude decides a stallion will do the job, and taking one from Hepburn Heights, he lines up outside the old school hall. Claude was confident. Because not only did he know the car, but he knew the streets through Portland Harbor, where for the Leones he had discouraged spank dealers from selling to their girls, through Chinatown where he had faced the triads numerous times, and past Mama's Restaurant, where he regularly met the Leone capo, Tony Cipriani, for work. Claude wanted to win, but he knew this was not just about the race. This was a test. El Burro needed a capable man behind both trigger and wheel, and because of this race, the rumors he had heard and the carnage he had witnessed, he had found his man. El Burro is a proud leader, a proud businessman. He has made his money in the pornography industry over many years. No small part of that success is down to what he is proud of most. I started my exotic entertainment business with nothing but the sizable contents of my leather pants. But both that contents and his pornography business are being threatened. Many of the gangs of Portland are trying to muscle in on what is a profitable business. A gang of no goods has threatened to remove my starring member if I don't pay them a cut. Three years prior, the Diablos won Hepburn Heights from the Leone family. They were pleased to have gained ground, but El Burro was saddened that the Leones were able to protect their claim of the Red Light District, of which El Burro has long coveted control. The Red Light District is the heart of the exotic here in Liberty City, with sex bars, cinemas, where the best people of the industry make their home. His business would have soared had the Diablos taken control. Hepburn Heights borders the Red Light District, and although Leone controlled, El Burro does own the dirty publication shop at the edge of the district, Triple X Mags. The war between the Diablos and the Leones is just lightly simmering right now, but another family, the Forellis, are trying to take what's his. El Burro has a plan. Pick up the bomb I'd eaten in hardwood, hijack the regular ice cream van on its rounds, and lure these fools to their doom with the jingly jingly. The bomb is easy enough, but the truck? When he's not looking for them, there are ice cream trucks everywhere in Portland. The jingle is on an eternal loop in his head. He eventually tracks one down. The sound of the ice cream van is too tempting on this warm Liberty night. The Forellis fall into the trap. They threatened the wrong man, amigo. But the threat to El Burro and what's his doesn't end there. Another gang, the Triads, stole and torched his precious car. Within it were items and keepsakes from years in the industry. Some from his early years as a porn star. Real collectibles that are irreplaceable, my friend. El Burro needs payback. They burned what was most precious. He will respond 
in kind. Teach these dryad vandals to fear El Burro's well in that raft! It's unclear to Claude if El Burro always references his assets in conversation. His size is plain for all to see who care to look for the many films he starred in over the years. It could be that El Burro, the donkey, is threatened by a man that manages to impress and elicit respect without even saying a word. It's clear for all to see just who has the big dick energy in Liberty City. El Burro's business interests are far more secure now Claude is on the payroll. Together they have impressed upon the gangs of Liberty that him, his gang and his pornography empire is not to be messed with. But there is one type of person that can't be reasoned with. The logic of violence doesn't compute. Spank addicts. Spank, the highly addictive recreational drug sweeping the city of late, causes some strange behaviour. One of these addicts is threatening the release of El Burro's finest achievement. This month's release of the pornographic magazine, Muff and the Mule. A thieving opportunist has stolen a van of my latest publication, Hub of the Press. But that spanked up idiot has left the rear doors open, and now my adult literature is being dropped all over Liberty. Follow that trail of Donkey Does Dallas volumes 1, 2, and 3. When you follow the trail to that thieving spank head, waste him. <laughs> Muff and the Mule has gained a loyal following in Liberty since it was first released. The arrival of the latest edition is highly anticipated. He cannot afford its launch to be disrupted. This was one of his best revenue streams. Claude rescues the fallen copies of this new publication and takes them to Triple X Max, where the surreptitious but eager fans get their copy. Nothing will stop El Burro's loyal following. The Diablo's business interests are assured for now, and thanks to Claude, El Burro can focus on the work that makes him truly happy. As a bonus for Claude's fine work, El Burro has a stack of porn dropped off at Claude's hideout, just outside Hepburn Heights. Some light reading before his next job. News just in from the traffic desk, repairs to the Callahan Bridge have been completed. Since the explosion, engineers have been working around the clock to get traffic flowing between Portland and Staunton Island once again. With news that the bridge is open, the city will flow once again, and news of Claude's capabilities will spread even further. There are many more people like El Burro, like Marty Chonks, that can use his help. Liberty City is back in business. The Colombian cartel brought down the bridge when they broke out the old Asian man from the prison transfer van all those weeks ago. Claude is grateful that they did because he is now free and on course to get the revenge he so dearly needs. To end the life that put him behind bars, that double-crossed him in front of the robbed Liberty City Bank, his former girlfriend, Catalina. Claude is still getting used to the streets of Staunton Island he knew Portland so well, but Staunton is new to him since the bridge opened. Staunton is a far bigger pond than Portland. Huge high-rises, big business, expensive cars. Claude was a boy in a sweet shop. Claude was also getting used to the power dynamic in Staunton. Catalina runs the Colombian cartel in the north. The Yakuza owns the casinos in the south and sandwiched between them both in Newport, a small but dangerous gang ply their trade, led by King Courtney, the Uptown Yardies. Claude gets a page. Word of mouth has seen his number pass like a winter cold between the crooks and delinquents of the city. He is directed to a payphone outside the Liberty City campus in Espatria. This is King Courtney. Me Yardy Posse could do with them rude boy driver and people is saying you the man. The Yardy's leader has work, but like El Burro in Hepburn Heights, Courtney has a test for him first. A street race to gauge both his grit and his edge. The rules are explained. 
first driver to a checkpoint gets the bling bling. Then it's on to the next stop. If you get more checkpoints than any other driver, I can have me a little work for you. Claude is spoiled for choice with what car to use. He elects to swap his cartel cruiser with a stinger. He guessed speed and handling would win the day here. Meeting outside the stadium, this race is different to what he's used to. It's not enough to just win. Each competitor has to accumulate checkpoints. Being the first there, then onto the next, it's carnage. Not knowing where the next checkpoint will be, he doesn't know the landscape well. Competitors approach from all directions. He should have stuck with the cruiser. He could have used the increased durability. Despite a car change, Claude accrues enough markers for victory. Claude now has another employer, King Courtney. The Yardies have never been big players in Liberty City. But in Liberty, to survive as a gang, you have to have something about you. And King Courtney and his Yardies have survived by arranging races, dealing narcotics, and fluidly aligning themselves with the most powerful gangs over the years. They worked with the Leones back in 98 before turning their back on them. In 2000, they aligned with a small outfit, only to double-cross them. Now there is rumour King Courtney is in talks with another prospective ally to strengthen their place in the city. The first job for the Yardies is not a matter of money or power, but a matter of honour. Two of my boys will be there any second to take you for a ride. We're going for a little ride into Epburn Heights. Kill me some filthy Diablo boo-boo's been batting up my Lady Queen Lizzie. Let's drive. Liberty City, arise! The Yardies have less decipherable street dialect than some of the gangs in Liberty, but Claude gets the gist of things. They are on their way to decimate the Diablos. You are no good. The Diablos have long been enemies of the Yardies, despite their turf existing on separate islands here in Liberty. Claude and two uptown Yardies are making the journey back to Portland because the Diablos have reportedly been saying disparaging things about the wife of King Courtney, his beloved Queen Lizzie. Honor dictates he must hit back with force. But Claude has not long ended an amicable business relationship with the Diablos. He helped them secure their business interests in Portland. What of his honor? But ever since Catalina's betrayal and the Leones turning on him, he sees no honor amongst thieves. Claude goes where the work is, and the work now is to take out as many Diablos as they can. Let's kill me some filthy Diablos. Before the cops can descend, they head back to safe ground in Newport. Okay, you're the kind of man we like as friend now. You iry man, real shooter. A real shooter? He had to be. To survive this city and to survive what is still to come in his dealings with the uptown Yardies. Queen Lizzie's honour is restored. A woman King Courtney loves dearly, nearly as much as the racing and fast cars that Yardies involve themselves with. A subject that Claude can help them with now. King Courtney with news of the job. I want you to steal me some gang car so we can do some naughty thing on our enemy turf. Drop them off at the garage in Newport and hear this. They're no use to me all broke up now. The Yardies were preparing for something big. Claude is charged with collecting tools for what looked to Claude as an all-out war. To round up gang cars so the Yardies can mount surprise attacks on each of their enemies in Liberty. A Diablo Stallion from Hepburn Heights. He would have preferred not to return here so soon. A Yakuza Stinger from South Staunton. There's always one at Asuka's condo. And back on Leone turf in Portland, a Mafia Sentinel. Under fire, he robs one outside Salvatore's Gentleman's Club. Claude returns them to Newport unscathed. Another job and more dollars for the war chest. Despite Claude's reputation for no-nonsense work, for no questions asked, Claude wondered what the Yardies were planning. This felt like a power play. Claude would soon find out. For Claude's final job, King Courtney's instructions are short. Now this. 
Get your little self over to Bedford Point. There's a stash in an old jalapia and it quick smart now. On the clock, Claude makes it to the stash hidden in the Esperanto. Inside isn't a stash, but a letter from the woman he hated most in the world, Catalina. King Courtney has aligned the Yardies to Catalina's Colombian cartel. They will provide muscle and help with spank distribution. In turn, they will receive strength, power and riches, their future assured. That was what the gang car theft was for, part of their plans to take ultimate control of liberty, to expand their spank empire. The Yardies and King Courtney are survivors, and they are looking to stand with the victors in this war of Liberty City. As part of this alliance, Courtney has led Claude into a trap, so Catalina can finish the job she thought she had done outside Liberty City Bank. Here you go, I got a present. Tick tock, what's on my. Here you go, I got a present. Come to daddy. Come here. <laughs> Spank, the highly addictive new drug in the city, eventually drives heavy users to psychosis. Here you go, I got a present. <laughs> Catalina has rigged van loads of these users with explosives, wound them up, and now let them loose on Claude. But the Yardies and Catalina forget that Claude is a real shooter, an arm to the teeth. Claude has been double-crossed again, first by the love of his life, next by who he thought were his brothers, the Lyon family, and now King Courtney. Claude would never get his chance for payback against Courtney. He disappears underground while still pulling the strings as the leader of the Uptown Yardies. King Courtney has garnered a reputation as a double-crosser, a turncoat over the years. Claude is not surprised. He moves on ever closer to his ultimate prize, revenge against Catalina. But before he gets there, there are many more jobs to do in the city for other criminals, criminals like D-Ice. Claude had little cause to visit Shoreside Vale until he met Donald Love. He was sent there by the troubled tycoon to retrieve a special package. Turns out the cartel had other ideas. He'll catch up with them later. He also dropped his business associate, the bent cop, Ray Machowski, off at the airport here. The Francis International Airport takes up most of the district. Further north, you have the businesses and industry that support it. Crossing the river, you can see the Cochrane Dam, powering the city with its hydroelectricity. Over the bridge is Cedar Grove, where the rich reside in elevation overlooking the ocean and Staunton Island beyond. This district is dripping with money, but if you take the winding road down to the lower south of Shoreside Vale, there's quite a different story. Wichita Gardens is a high-rise housing project where the poorest people of the city make their home. It's a place the police rarely go and residents tiptoe amongst and around gangs doing deals and touting weapons. The gang that controls this territory is the Southside Hoods, and having taken over the projects in 98 with the help of the Leones, are stagnating and starting to unravel. The residents here can sense something in the air, like a volcano waking up. And when Claude arrives to accept a job from gang leader D. Ice, that volcano erupts. The Southside Hoods are made up of two sub-gangs, the Red Jacks, led by D-Ice, and the Purple Nines. They acted as a single organised organism to secure their territory in 98, aligned in their pursuit of power and wealth, but it is when that power had been won and their common enemy receded that they started to turn within. They each started to wear their colours more proudly on the streets, and their differences cherished even more keenly. Like their allies, the Leones, the Southside Hoods had always stayed clear of Spank. It brought too much heat from the cops, and they did not like the effect it had on the city. But for the Purple Nines, the draw of hard cash was too rich to turn down. For D-Ice, 
This was a step too far. It had to end. Don't fuck with me. These young punks, they come onto the streets and they got nothing but guns and spank on their mind. I want you to show these punk ass bitches how a real drive-by works. D-Ice has been a capable, brave leader of the Red Jacks for some time. And this tactical attack would have been something he would have been at the forefront of. But D-Ice is incarcerated, a victim of the city's futile clampdown on gangs. He was out of sight of the streets, but not out of mind. He still very much ran the day-to-day -day from his cell and knew all the goings on in the city. He knew that Claude was the man to engage for this task. And Claude was only too glad to attack the business interests of the Colombian cartel. Anything to expose their leader, his enemy, Catalina. Claude's task, to take out any gang member rocking purple. If they were gonna start a war, the Red Jacks should tip the balance first. Take these nines off of here. Claude lights up Wichita Gardens. With their numbers cold on the streets, next, D-Ice needs to focus on their Spank Enterprise. These bitches got armored cars and now they're running Spank and slinging it to brothers with no fear. To preserve their interests, the Purple Nines have invested heavily in security and protection. Their vehicles have been armored to the teeth to protect the Spank within. A drive-by Uzi won't touch it. They need something far more probing. There's a car parked up the way. There's some stuff in there to put these sissies on blast and wreck all their armored stuff. Claude had been enjoying playing with the toys supplied to him by 8-Ball. There's nothing better to get a job done than rigging a car to blow. But this new method of explosion raised the bar of enjoyment for Claude considerably. Bomb buggies. Radio controlled C4. Driven remotely and detonating under three armoured spankmobiles would cut the legs away from the nines and all but gift Wichita Gardens to D-Ice and the Red Jacks. Although they were winning on points, D-Ice needed to knock them on the canvas. Out for the count. This would prove difficult. The Nines had receded and organized retaliation in guerrilla fashion. They looked to hit where it would hurt most. Every gang loved their car. The cartel had their cruisers, the Yardies their Lobos. For D-Ice, he loved his Infernus so much. The fastest car in the city. That is what he missed the most, not his family, not his home, but cruising in his ride. Hard earned from years building up the jacks. Some effort's white, my wheels to blow. If I lose those wheels, my rep on the street will be dead. Claude is used to the care needed in driving a rigged vehicle, but D-Ice is nervous. The clock's ticking and the wiring is messed up. One pothole too many and that thing could blow. Claude needs to get the car to St. Mark's over the water for diffusal. The tunnel was the quickest way for sure, but beating the clock and navigating traffic at speed was the test. The garage is opposite Salvatore's Gentleman's Club. The own attention is all he needs. Claude is no longer welcome there. The car arrives unscathed and D-Ice's reputation and vehicle remain intact. Claude returns the car to Shoreside Vale. Now, how to end this war for good? D-Ice has a plan. Them knives are down to a few scabby herds, but they still want to bring it. They agreed to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. He has supreme faith in the abilities of Claude. Claude is to arm himself only with a bat. And with D-Ice's brother, end the Purple Nines once and for all. D-Ice would dearly love to be there. I join you, but I ain't due for my parole here for another three months, know what I mean? D-Ice has been focused on perfect behavior inside. And the future looks bright, in no small part to Claude. If the Jacks can win the streets, he can join them in three short months and perhaps lead them to greatness in the city.
Go and meet my baby brother. He'll show you where they're fighting at, alright, son? There are rules. Bats only. No guns, no cars. This is a battle for respect. You cool? Let's go crack some skulls. They meet in the park gardens of Cedar Grove, overlooking the territory they so proudly fight for. Although outnumbered, Claude knows his way around a baseball bat. The Purple Nines are down. Their final innings over. The Red Jacks victorious. This would be the last task Claude would do for the Jacks. Their destiny was now their own to safeguard. But Claude would walk away from Wichita Gardens knowing that he was one step closer to getting Catalina out in the open. He had stripped the Colombian cartel of one of its allies, a sales linchpin in their Spank empire. Claude didn't know it, but very soon, only minutes away from here at Cochrane Dam, Claude would finally get his chance at revenge. And if you would like to see the complete story of that revenge, check out my story of Grand Theft Auto 3 on the link above now and in the description. Like the video if you did, and if you are not subscribed, make sure you are, and thank you so much to my patrons who contribute to give me the time and space to make these videos for you. If you would like to support me and get ad-free advanced access to all my videos, head over to Patreon, link on the screen now. I'm The Patient Wolf, and this has been the story of the phone missions in Grand Theft Auto 3.